Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, Canada considers new measures against travelers from India as that country faces an explosion of cases. I'm really afraid this time that the, uh, it has gone out of control. COVID overwhelms hospitals there as dozens of flights with COVID positive people land here. Plus, what we know about the new variant. Also tonight, an ICU nurse in BC speaks out. Something about this one just really hit hard. Her emotional post pleading for change. After a historic verdict. Say his name. George Floyd! Turning a moment of accountability into a movement toward justice. And what happens when a public lake is surrounded by private land? The guy has eight or nine billion dollars. All we want to do is go recreate and go put our little boat in the lake and go fishing. We take you inside a boundary battle with cross-country implications. This is The National. Canada's third wave of COVID-19 is crashing down hard across the country tonight, fueled by variants of concern. And now, new questions about a variant of interest, first seen in India that has been confirmed in both Quebec and BC. That has the opposition calling on the government to better protect Canadians. Tonight, we'll take you through what we know about the double mutated variant, as well as the spiraling situation in India. But David Cochran begins with the Canadian government's dilemma over whether to tighten the border. COVID is surging and variants are spreading across India at one of the worst rates in the world. But dozens of flights from India carrying COVID positive passengers have landed in Canada in the last three weeks alone. The Prime Minister is now not even restricting flights from COVID hotspots to stop the entry of new dangerous variants. We have some of the strongest measures in the world on the borders. Those measures don't target specific countries. Instead, all air passengers to Canada need a negative COVID test before they board their flight, face mandatory quarantine when they arrive, and two negative tests before that can end. No border measures are completely 100% um, uh, effective, of course. Every layer adds another layer of protection. And more layers may be coming. The government is doing a new risk analysis of the threat India's cases and emerging variants might pose, considering measures like those adopted in the UK. We put India now on our red list, uh, which means that anybody arriving from uh, India to the UK has to be a permanent resident of the UK. Travellers otherwise are not allowed in. The Canadian government should, should do whatever it takes to keep the country safe. And um, you know, I think uh, people will fall behind the government on this and, and make sure that they, they, it, is, it, is, uh, it is supported. Okay, so David, when will we hear what the government plans to do here? Yeah, Andrew, the government's going to have something to say pretty quickly. Within the next 24 hours, I'm, I'm told the final details are still being sorted, but the government's looking at everything from stricter public health measures for travelers to an entry ban like the one in the United Kingdom. Okay, and we know India has stopped vaccine exports to deal with its case surge. Do we know what the impact would be on Canada? Yeah, so right now, one and a half million doses of the AstraZeneca Covishield vaccine have been delayed. There was one million due in April, another 500,000 in May, and we don't know when or if those will get here. So it's a setback for sure, but luckily it's offset by the boost in Pfizer deliveries, which are going to double to two million doses a week starting in May. Okay, David Cochran in Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll show you just how bad things have gotten in India, going through a devastating second wave. Today alone, more than 295,000 new cases of COVID-19, just shy of a world record. India also recorded its highest daily death toll, 2023. It sits only behind the U.S. in overall cases. And its second wave has skyrocketed above its first. Salima Shivji has this portrait of catastrophe. <laughs> In Delhi, a crisis deepens with hospitals completely overwhelmed and at a breaking point. Please come see my mother, this man pleads, but it's too late for her. Oxygen is in such short supply in many parts of the country, it's being shipped to hotspots like precious cargo, with many waiting in vain. This man says his wife couldn't breathe, but the hospital didn't have any oxygen to spare. By morning, she was dead. India's second wave is crippling the country, fueled by that double variant that may be more severe. 
With deaths hitting record highs, crematoriums are overrun. The grief raw for so many and doctors are swamped. So what will happen in the coming weeks, so I'm, I'm really afraid this time that the, uh, it has gone out of control. So bad the capital is under lockdown. Shops and restaurants closed all week. India, once eager to export vaccines to other nations, now struggles to vaccinate its own population. Lockdown se bachana hai. Prime Minister Narendra Modi addressed the nation this week, calling on lockdowns to be used only as a last resort. But sharp criticism is being directed his way. He spent weeks attending packed election rallies BJP as voters crowded in tight spaces to cast their ballots for the staggered election. And officials did little to curb a massive religious festival that's been blamed for super spreading the virus. India, lulled by extremely low case counts earlier this year, opened up and relaxed measures. Now it's reeling like never before. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, now this is a good time to bring in Dr. Matthew Outen, who is an infectious diseases specialist at the Jewish General Hospital in Montreal. And Dr. Outen, we just heard in Salima's reporting this mention of a double variant with uh, confirmed cases we know in Canada, particularly in British Columbia. Can you tell us what we know about this variant, what it can do? We're still learning a lot about it. Uh, one of the particular concerns is that we've seen these uh, mutations previously separately, but never together within the same virus. And both these uh, mutations contribute substantially towards potential risk of uh, causing uh, both uh, more frequent disease, as well as potentially causing disease in people who've previously been immune, either from recovering from natural infection or from vaccination. And the fact that we're seeing both of them uh, together in one uh, virus certainly makes us concerned that this really could have the potential to cause major problems, including what's been recently witnessed in India. Okay, so we'll be uh, continuing to monitor that. Thank you, doctor. My pleasure. Well, hospitals in northern Ontario have now been told to ramp down elective surgeries, matching what's happening elsewhere, as Ontario works to free up hospital capacity. Today, the province reported another 4,200 cases. A record-breaking 790 COVID patients are now in intensive care, 566 of them on ventilators. And as hospitals and some hotspots fill up, Medical Transport Service Orange is now transferring patients 24 hours a day. Meanwhile, after months of refusing to implement paid sick leave for workers who catch COVID or have to isolate, today the government signaled change is coming. We're uh, disappointed that, uh, uh, that uh, the federal budget did not include some of the enhancements that we had asked for. Uh, the government of Ontario will be, uh, uh, will be uh, coming forward with uh, additional enhancements uh, uh, in the very, very near future. Premier Doug Ford, meanwhile, is spending his second day in self-isolation after a staffer tested positive for the virus. Ford himself has tested negative, though, and was vaccinated almost two weeks ago on April 9th. In British Columbia, hospitals are also under increasing pressure as COVID admissions continue to rise. And as Briar Stewart shows us, that has doctors and nurses warning of burnout and begging people to take this pandemic seriously. From the outside, it's hard to get a true sense of the state of BC's hospitals, but those on the front lines will tell you beds are filling up with very sick patients. Something about this one just really hit hard. Kendall Scuda posted this photo of herself after an emotional shift at this hospital in Abbotsford. She wanted people not following the rules to know the toll COVID is taking. A patient under the age of 60 died on her shift. You know, the patient's close to my parents' age, and so I, I can't imagine them getting sick and dying. It just breaks my heart. More tragic still when those dying are even younger. In the past week, a child under the age of two and a patient in their 20s died. Whether you're in your 20s or you're younger or your 30s or your 40s, COVID-19 can be vicious. This chart shows the number of COVID patients hospitalized during the pandemic, and for now, that curve keeps rising. In the past week, hospitalizations have increased more than 20%. ICU admissions are also up more than 35%. Some surgeries have been postponed as a few hospitals have started to use surge beds. Officials say the system has capacity, but doctors say space isn't the only metric to consider. Lots of people are tired. Lots of people are burning out. Lots of people are wanting to get outside of the COVID world. 
still provide care somehow. The good news is the overall case count has started to dip, but even if that trend continues, hospitals will stay busy. ICU and the hospital um, will continue to rise for a while because it takes a couple of weeks before cases get that bad that they have to go in the hospital and then they stay in the hospital for a couple of weeks. So it will still be some time before the pressure inside here starts to ease. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Nova Scotia saw a spike today, reporting 25 new cases. That's their highest daily number since November. The province's chief medical officer says there are concerning signs of community transmission and that more public health measures will have to be implemented. That's in addition to new border restrictions coming into effect tomorrow, which will severely limit travel into the province. And there are some bad numbers in Alberta, too. 1,699 new cases, the worst one-day case count this year in the province. But it came as the government announced workers will be given paid leave in order to get their vaccine. It says new legislation will apply to both full and part-time workers, regardless of how long they've been working. They'll be able to take up to three hours of paid leave to get the shot. There are similar rules in British Columbia and Saskatchewan as well. Okay, let's turn to the U.S. A day after Derek Chauvin was convicted for the murder of George Floyd, the entire Minneapolis Police Department is now under federal investigation. And as Susan Ormston shows us, it will be very broad in scope, even including how police handled the weeks and months after Floyd's death. Reflecting on a verdict that many hope moves the scales of equal justice, George Floyd inspired hope but left a reminder Many others killed by police, their names inscribed here. This memorial created after George Floyd was killed. Today, the Department of Justice in the U.S. launched a wide-ranging investigation into policing here. We'll assess whether the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, including during protests. Was Chauvin a symbol of excessive force and systemic racism baked into a police department? Were protesters suppressed with overarching force? A sweeping review. Policies, training, supervision. Not for the protection of residents. Black communities have long been asking for just that, says Nikima Levy Armstrong, a lawyer and activist. I'm glad that they're finally taking a look, but we asked them to do this many years ago. My hope is that this leads to a complete overhaul of the Minneapolis Police Department, particularly being able to uproot those officers who have a history of excessive force and who have a history of deadly force. Derek Chauvin is now jailed in solitary confinement 23 hours a day as the magnitude of his verdict reverberates. Jubilation last night at George Floyd Square Marsha Howard's been here since last May. The people were united in their indignation, in their rage, in their determination. Today, close by in Billy Hill's barbershop, a long, difficult year ending. Relief, number one, that he got convicted. Number two, that it's over. Billy, this morning the Department of Justice said they're going to uh, launch a big investigation into the Minneapolis police force. Good. Now, let's see if they go do it, do the work. It's one thing saying it, it's nothing of going about doing it. Hope for the best, the barber's benediction. And Susan, uh, Derek Chauvin's conviction is hardly the end of this story. No, we are in Brooklyn Center tonight at a shrine for Dante Wright, the 20-year-old black man who was killed here just 10 days ago, fatally shot by police. His funeral is tomorrow in Minneapolis. The Floyd family is staying on to support this family, and Al Sharpton is giving the eulogy, expected to underscore that deaths in black communities by police did not end with George Floyd, nor with one police department. Susan Ormiston, thank you very much. Well, at nearly the same time as the jury returned the verdict against Derek Chauvin, a police officer in Columbus, Ohio, shot and killed a black teenaged girl. We will show you some of the body cam video of the moments leading up to the shooting in this next story. Katie Simpson takes us through what happened. 
It was less than 15 seconds from the time the officer arrived to when shots were fired. A chaotic scene that ended in 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant's death. Police released a slowed down version of the officer's body camera footage. There, in the ripped pants, that's Bryant chasing someone who falls to the ground. The officer pulls his gun as the teenager seems to lunge at another person with a knife in hand. And that is when the officer fires four shots. Regardless of the circumstances associated with this, a 16-year-old girl lost her life yesterday. I sure as hell wish it had happened. I plead with the community, let us not rush to judgment. As I said last night, fast facts should not come at the cost of complete and accurate facts. Bryant's death has sparked fresh protests. A gathering originally organized to mark Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict became a grief-stricken demonstration with more anger aimed at police. They're trained to de-escalate, and so they need to start de-escalating when it comes to black people because we're not a threat. We're scared for our lives. An independent investigation into the officer's actions is underway, which comes at a time when police have little credibility in some communities. There's very uh, limited amounts of trust from the black community right now. For decades, there have been demands for reform, with one expert urging police forces to recruit more officers from the communities they're serving. The only way we are, are going to be able to make any positive change is you have to become a part of that system. With a renewed sense of urgency in the public demand for change, the White House is pressuring lawmakers to finally pass the police reform bill that was created in the wake of George Floyd's death. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. The United Nations today called for the immediate medical evacuation of Alexei Navalny from a Russian jail. The opponent of President Vladimir Putin has been languishing in prison on a hunger strike. At the same time, thousands across Russia defied Moscow's ban on protests to show their support. Our Chris Brown was there. Considering they risk being jailed, beaten by riot police, or having their families threatened, it's remarkable tonight's protests across Russia drew the thousands of people they did. Despite of being really terrified, I come here today because if I don't come, if these people don't come, it will be like this for a very, very long time. It's been a harsh three months for supporters of imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny, and of course for Navalny himself. Thrown in jail after surviving an assassination attempt, he's been mistreated, claim supporters. He's on a hunger strike and in an Instagram post described himself as being like a skeleton. It's about people in Russia who do not want to be ruled by murderers and thieves, and that's the people who sit behind that wall in the Kremlin. Vladimir Karamurza is one of the few recognizable opposition figures who hasn't been jailed or fled Russia. In many ways, the Kremlin's crackdown on Russia's opposition is part of its broader conflict with the West. Without offering any evidence, authorities have said that Alexei Navalny, his organization, and many of supporters here are working on behalf of the United States. Earlier in the day, Vladimir Putin suggested recent sanctions and diplomatic expulsions from countries as varied as the U.S., Poland and the Czech Republic amounted to picking on Russia. He suggested it's become a sport, but warned Russia would respond. Notable tonight, though, was that in Moscow anyway, the riot police didn't resort to their batons nearly as much as they have in the past. Perhaps they didn't need to. With Navalny in jail and authorities moving to declare his political group illegal, this may be the last big public opposition rally Russia sees in a long time. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. Well, Queen Elizabeth marked her 95th birthday today. But of course, it is a dark time, coming just four days after her husband, Prince Philip's funeral. In a statement, the Queen says the royal family remains in a period of great sadness, but thanked everyone for their support in recent days. Because of the two-week mourning period, there was no traditional gun salutes for the Queen's birthday. Well, a mysterious disease in New Brunswick has residents concerned, and they're looking for answers. Is it in the water? Is it in the air? Too many questions and not enough answers. The demand for transparency about an illness that has taken six lives. Plus... 
There we go. The fight for public land. Landowners are restricting access more broadly over what we've ever seen before. Private owners are blocking access to Canada's wilderness. And making a little magic out of a pandemic necessity. We're back in two. A Calgary doctor who's a top advisor to the World Health Organization is being criticized by experts here and abroad for his stance on how the coronavirus spreads. As Aaron Collins explains, some say it is outdated and costing lives. A respirator called we all know masks are a must, but are we wearing the right ones? Well, this doctor says no. She says many Canadians need beefier N95 masks. Uh, if you have to be uh, in a, a factory or a mail sorting facility or you're a teacher in a classroom, these are all crowded, high-risk places and uh, should be wearing respirators. That's because there's mounting evidence that the virus mostly spreads through tiny aerosol particles that linger in the air, not mainly through droplets from things like coughing or sneezing that fall to the ground. This paper published in the medical journal The Lancet is clear COVID is airborne and using better masks and ventilation would save lives. The number of deaths that, that are partly attributable for taking a flawed uh, view of the mode of transmission are, are huge, huge. That view, a flashpoint at a recent online panel on the topic. We need to start treating this for what it is, which is a dominantly aerosol transmitted disease. Yeah, I would completely disagree with you, Dr. Fisman. That objection matters. This Canadian doctor is a key advisor to the World Health Organization. He insists current practices are good enough to limit the spread of COVID-19. Social distancing or physical distancing, as some call it, hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfection of surfaces. That's where our focus should be. This science about how it's transmitted and where it goes, it'll get itself sorted out. But many experts say Dr. John Conley's stance is hindering the fight to contain the virus. He does carry a lot of weight with WHO, and um, unfortunately, I think he's, his thinking is still stuck in kind of what we knew 20 or 30 years ago and hasn't really updated. For his part, Dr. Conley says he's just one voice among many at the WHO. But as Canada struggles with more contagious variants, calls to treat the virus as primarily airborne now are growing louder. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Now, one of the pandemic's main lessons is how important clear and open public health messaging really is. But in New Brunswick, there is growing concern over a mysterious neurological illness and the unanswered questions many residents have about it. Kayla Hounsel has their story. It's clean, it's open, we love the forests. Krista Brown lived in New Brunswick for three years. She loved it so much, she decided to move back. She's about to close on a house. Had I known that there was this neurological disease out there, I probably wouldn't have pursued this purchase. The property is south of the Acadian Peninsula, where there is a cluster of cases of the new unknown disease. There's another in the Moncton area for a total of 44 cases. Six people have died. This man's family believes he has the disease. Doctors are investigating his case. Health officials say the disease is similar to Creutzfeldt-Jakob, a rare and fatal brain disease, but those tests came back negative. It's not cancer, it's not a brain tumor, it's not a stroke, it's not epilepsy. We just want to know what it is. The first case can be traced back to 2015. More started to emerge in 2019. But the mysterious disease's existence only became public just over a month ago, when Radio-Canada obtained an internal memo. It's terrifying and it's infuriating. Brown is mostly concerned for those battling the disease. She's calling on the provincial government to be more transparent. So far, public health hasn't provided any public updates or held any information sessions in the communities affected. That's uh, extremely troubling. If the government doesn't share this, these kinds of details, it provides a vacuum where rumors and misinformation can spread. The government says there will be a website focused on the matter. It is expected to go live any day. Um, we know that this, um, this, this mysterious illness creates a lot of anxiety. So instead of celebrating her new home, Brown is still struggling with whether to move at all. Is it in the water? Is it in the air? Too many questions and not enough air. 
She's hoping more information will help her make that decision. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, a dispute has been heating up to save old growth forests. That's why we're here, is to pause the saw. These activists in BC want logging to stop, but others say the industry is their livelihood. Plus, despite Derek Chauvin's guilty verdict, police forces have a long road to rebuilding public trust. What comes next? My conversation with a former U.S. police officer right after this. Well, just one day after Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all counts for the killing of George Floyd, the Justice Department announced it's planning a federal investigation into the use of force by Minneapolis police officers. And as we also heard earlier in the program, it comes amid growing calls for police reform in the United States. So let's talk about that now with Joe Estead, a former police officer who worked in Richmond, Virginia. He's also written a book on the topic called Police Brutality matters. Uh, Mr. Estead, hello to you. C can we start just by uh, me hearing from you? Because I want to hear you articulate what it is that you've seen from within police ranks that needs reform, changes that need to happen from within. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. And my experience in law enforcement is they have the mindset of protect us, police them. We need to take away that mindset because Yes, as a good officer, you want the support of the department, and the department will support you. But the bad part is they support bad officers as well. So it's overall a, a us against the mentality, and we need to take that away from the culture of law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement officers serve the community, and they need to be a part of that community they serve. And with my experience, a lot of the officers that I work with wasn't part of the community that they were policing. Since yesterday's verdict, a lot has been made about the way in which the Minneapolis Police Department told the world what had happened with George Floyd on the day that George Floyd died. So, so let me read, if I could, just a, a little line from their news release. This was from May 25th of last year. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. It goes on, he died a short time later. That's a hell of a way to describe what happened. I mean. When you read that statement, what do you see? I see officers at the scene, because that wasn't police administration. That was actually his report himself. So, of course, he's trying to cover up his, his, his actions. You know, he's trying to minimize the damage that he, he's, he's caused. So it's just an officer trying to cover his tracks. He wasn't alone. Um, where is the accountability that, that comes from within? With, when you start talking about accountability, there is no accountability. It's always a protect us, police them. I've made uh, uh, I made complaints against other officers for excessive uh, for excessive use of force, and I was always told we handle within, don't go outside. Uh, we take care of our own kind of mindset. So there, there's really no accountability. So then, in your mind, can change come about on a broad scale from? within or must it necessarily come from the outside? It definitely has to come from the outside. The police management has been policing itself, policing police itself for since it started. And we've known that police can't police themselves. They take care of themselves. They protect the entity of law enforcement. And it definitely has to come from outside. Knowing the history, knowing the context, how does this feel, or does it feel different to you as a moment in time from a policing perspective when it comes to the question of can we see meaningful change starting now? Yes, I definitely believe that we can see change. And I think this case has shed so much light on what goes on with the inner walls of the culture of policing. For a long time, my community, the poor black community, has been victimized by bad and excessive aggressive police officers. We've been complaining about police brutality for a long time. This is the first time that I've seen a, a diverse group of people at the protests. I attend the protests. I attend previous protests. It was it's pretty much uh, predominantly black. We're protesting. We want justice. The crowd is normally black. This particular protest with George, it was all walks of life. I see the overwhelming support of whites at the protests. So I think this is exactly the, the shift in change that we definitely need, a unifying front. 
Joe Estead, I hope we get a chance to talk again. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Well, a lake is at the center over a fight for public land. The truth is they're trying to take control of these lakes for their own private use. Private property surrounding Canada's wilderness. Ranchers say they're protecting the land. Plus, the economy has recovered uh, better than expected. The Bank of Canada is scaling back on stimulus. What's behind their positive outlook? Stay with us. Welcome back. One of British Columbia's old growth forests has become a flashpoint. Anti-logging activists are defying a court order by refusing to leave a protest camp, fighting to save increasingly rare old growth trees. Greg Rasmussen takes us there. Preparing for a confrontation. I think they thought we were just gonna go away. Anti-logging activists are vowing to make it as difficult as possible for the RCMP to move in and open up these roads, which lead to one of the few remaining stands of old growth forest in the area. We're here for the long haul until Ferry Creek is protected. Several blockades have been set up as activists wait for police to enforce a court order. Uh, we call this the grandfather tree. Shauna Knight has been here almost full time since August. So that's why we're here, is to pause the saw. Everyone she expects to police to arrive any things. day. Ultimately, if I'm faced with that, yeah, I'll be arrested. For decades, the industry has argued trees like this are incredibly valuable, but as lumber. The industry says these trees are vital to its economic survival. Uh, the less that everybody harvests, the less that they can uh, support the sawmills, the less that they can support the value-added plants, the less revenue that comes to the, the province. The local First Nation, which gets a cut of revenue from forest company Teal Jones, wants the logging to go ahead, saying, we do not welcome or support unsolicited involvement or interference by others in our territory. Our political elite have been duped. <laughs> But other community members oppose the plan to keep cutting old growth. You don't cut down the forest, honey. You leave it up and you go there and pray and meditate. The Sierra Club of Canada says original old growth forests on Vancouver Island have gone from this to less than 10% of what was there before logging started. This area is near where Teal Jones wants to log in Ferry Creek. Bill Jones' niece, Katie George Jim, is one of those waiting for the police to move in. It is my responsibility to the law of the land to be here or to be in, in defense of um, territories under threat. They can't arrest us all! Many here are drawing comparisons to BC's last major war in the woods in Clackwit Sound in the 1990s, which led to more trees being protected. The goal now, the same as it was then, to stop old growth logging here while there's still time. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Port Renfrew, BC. There is another battle over land brewing in BC, pitting recreational fishers against a billionaire cattle ranch owner. So what happens when a public lake is surrounded by private land? As Briar Stewart shows us, it's a debate not unique to BC. <laughs> This muddy road cuts through BC's Nicola Valley. It might not look like much, but a section of it has been part of a decades-long battle because of where it leads and who owns what's around it. We're just trying to make a living raising beef. And it's an understatement to say that the Douglas Lake Cattle Company is succeeding at that. It's Canada's largest private ranch. It was first founded in 1884, but the cowboy way of life still very present today. We've got 200,000 acres about of deeded land, private, but we're not in the land business and we're not in the development business. We're in the cattle business. And so protecting that land is number one. Protecting, Joe Gardner says, from people trespassing and destroying the grasslands. The ranch has been embroiled in a court battle over two lakes, Minnie and Stony. It owns all the land bordering them, but not the lakes themselves. They're crown assets, but BC's Court of Appeal has ruled that the general public can access them. 
because that road doesn't actually reach the shorelines. The only way to fish there is by paying to stay in one of the company's lodges and cabins. The truth is they're trying to take control of these lakes for their own private use. Rick McGowan and the Nicola Valley Fish and Game Club have been pushing for years to access these lakes and others. They don't put cheap locks on here. There we go. They felt vindicated when the BC Supreme Court sided with them and crushed when the appeal court overturned the decision last month. This is another road that Douglas Lake is locked. McGowan hoped this would be a precedent setting case, but has now left the club on the verge of bankruptcy. Many have framed the legal fight as a David and Goliath battle. Douglas Lake Cattle Company is owned by American billionaire Stan Kroenke, whose portfolio includes some of the world's most profitable sports teams, the Los Angeles Rams, Denver Nuggets, Colorado Avalanche, and the Arsenal Football Club. And the guy has eight or nine billion dollars. This is like a, a hobby to him. And to us, people like us, we retire in this country, and all we want to do is go recreate and go put our little boat in the lake and go fishing. Back on the ranch, Gardner insists money has nothing to do with it. It's either private or it isn't. It doesn't matter whether it's your last dime if you want to protect your land. While this case is perhaps the most high profile example of public access pitted against private rights, it's become an issue throughout the province. The fact that you have a scenario where there's a public lake that the public can't access, what does it say about the rules as they are? I mean, I think it points to a long standing gap in British Columbia and Canadian legislation that we now need to reconcile increasingly uh, private right to exclude with the public's right to access. Deborah Curran is with the Environmental Law Centre at the University of Victoria. She says on Vancouver Island, public access has been a big issue. Landowners are restricting access more broadly over what we've ever seen before. There are about 60,000 kilometres of forest service roads in the province and timber companies sometimes use lock gates to block them off, which can make lakes and trails inaccessible. This map shows many gates in the central and southern part of Vancouver Island. All the red ones are currently closed. So are you allowed to go down this road to access the lakes? Not anymore. The only way you can is if the gate is opened or you apply and are granted permission. Kim Hill is an avid fly fisher who likes the back country for its quiet, pristine lakes. But today she's in a park. There's no way to get in there because she can't drive to some of the more remote lakes, which she says is unfair. Or Canadian birthright to have uh, ability to go and enjoy the wilderness and, uh, and not, have to, not to have to jump through piles of hoops or beg for the keys for the gate. The issues on the island are just another example of where individuals and groups have raised concerns about not being able to reach public areas for recreation. Curran says the province hasn't been pressured to act, but she thinks that will change. These groups will get together and there will be a provincial lobby to address it, much like it has been addressed in many other countries. Like the UK and Sweden, which has adopted what's called right to roam. The latter allows people to bike, camp and even pick berries on private land. In BC, the government says it's reviewing the court case involving the two lakes and could make changes to give people more access to public property. Even though the battle over the lakes has created friction, there is one thing both sides agree on. They don't think right to roam is right for BC. I think they should leave it alone with, with private property being such a small percentage of the province. We are not supporting crossing private property. We're supporting open public roads to public places. In other words, McGowan and the rest of the club aren't looking to pry open the entire province, just pathways to what's already considered public, but out of reach for most. Briar Stewart, CBC News, near Merritt, BC. Well, the Bank of Canada says the country is en route to a strong post-pandemic recovery. As the restrictions come off, the economy will bounce back quickly. Why Canada's money policymakers have hope for what's around the corner. And making the most of quarantine with the leftovers of a pandemic essential. Stay with us.
I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast Front Burner, advocates of a national childcare program have been calling for one for decades. Governments have even gotten close a few times. Is this finally the moment? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. A Bloc Québécois MP apologized in the House of Commons today after taking a photo of a colleague who appeared naked during a virtual sitting of Parliament last week. Je tiens aujourd'hui à présenter mes excuses à la Chambre. Bloc MP Sébastien Lemire says he has apologized to Liberal MP Will Amos directly for taking the picture of an internal video feed. Lemire says he does not know how it was circulated to the media. An image of Amos changing in his office was leaked last week. He says he didn't realize his camera was on. Well, today, the Bank of Canada gave a clear signal the economy is shaking off its pandemic paralysis. Yes, the third wave is hitting hard right now, but hope is in the forecast in the form of hiring and spending. Peter Armstrong explains. After a year that threw every economic indicator into turmoil, the Bank of Canada sees light at the end of the tunnel. The economy has has performed, has recovered uh, better than expected. The difference in tone between that and the federal budget unveiled this week is stark. The greater danger today is not to invest in a strong recovery from the COVID recession. So who's right? Well, they both are. We all want the same thing. We want a complete recovery. We want Canadians back to work. To do that, both the government and the central bank must play their part. The government helps by getting support to businesses and individuals. The Bank of Canada's job is to make sure the financial system is stable and borrowing costs remain low. So last March, the central bank slashed interest rates and started buying $4 billion in government debt every week. Today's announcement means it will slow but not stop that program. We've adjusted that down to $3 billion per week. That is still uh, an exceptional amount of stimulus. Because while the economy is doing better than expected, it's nowhere near normal yet. But we know what the path out of crisis looks like. As COVID cases drop, the economy reopens, businesses rehire, laid off workers start getting paychecks again, people start to spend. So far this year, even limited reopenings have shown a quick, strong recovery. That has given us more confidence that, you know, as bad as this, as, as tough as this third wave is going to be, uh, as we get through it, as the restrictions come off, the economy will bounce back quickly. Remember, the reopening he's referring to, that was extremely limited. And now, as we start to look at the prospect of a more broad-based lifting of restrictions this summer, the bank has revised its forecast, now expecting to see the economy boom like it hasn't in decades. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Well, 14 days in hotel quarantine ain't easy. And it's even harder with a toddler. But one Canadian family decided to make a little pandemic magic. And we were getting an overwhelming amount of, like, containers and plastic. The Bagasaurus is our moment. <laughs>We'll take a good look at the incredibly rare Bagasaurus, a dinosaur species so rare it exists in just one place, a quarantine hotel room in Perth, Australia. Okay, we're getting serious now. BC's Carly Catalano and her family are making the move to Australia, but first they had to quarantine for 14 days and their room service magic to keep toddler Florence occupied during that time is our moment. While we're in quarantine, we actually didn't know how it was gonna work with food and stuff. So basically you just kind of get brought whatever they give you. And we were getting an overwhelming amount of like containers and plastic and paper uh, bags. And so Sam, he's a design engineer and um, we thought, oh, let's, you know, we gotta stay creative over these two weeks or we'll go crazy with our toddler. And so we asked Flo like, oh, you know, what, what should we make um, while we're in quarantine? And she's, of course, right away was like, oh, a dinosaur. <laughs> I think after day five or six, we had about enough plastic containers that we could make the neck. Um, and, then, and then we got the legs out of the rectangular containers, and then we started to skin it with the, with the bags. And it all just kind of came together after that. <laughs> we really tried to just stay positive and creative 
during it and think of it as like a, a time for us to like hang out because I don't know when we'll ever have I guess two weeks where we know that we literally cannot do anything but hang out and do things together. <laughs> Ingenuity at work. Uh, I love it as a piece of art and hey, just as a, as a thing to play with. And I love the little details too. Cotton balls for eyes, if you noticed, and that tongue, a red balloon that Florence had popped. They repurposed just about everything for that. That's the National for this April 21st. Have a great night.